Yankee Stadium in New York. It's the Mets' last stand. They've got Dwight Gooden on the mound, but they trail the Cubs by seven. Some of you will see the California Angels. They're just half a game out in the American League West. The Angels are in Chicago. The White Sox are alive. Everybody is out west. But first up, it's Major League Baseball, an inside look at baseball, and a preview of tonight's game. Brought to you by Miller High Life, the best beer for the best time of day. Welcome to Miller Time, and by Benjamin Moore Paints, available at your local Benjamin Moore dealer. Shea Stadium in New York with the airplanes overhead. Every ticket has been sold. It is a cool early September evening. It's a nice night for a pennant race. Hi again, everyone, and welcome to our special primetime edition of the Major League Baseball Game of the Week. I'm Len Berman. The numbers tell the story. The Cubs lead the Mets by a full seven games. They've beaten the Mets the last seven they've played. Three games this weekend between the clubs, three games next weekend. The Mets virtually have to sweep all six to stay in the race. Last time the teams met in Chicago, fireworks. One month ago today, Ed Lynch hits Keith Moreland. Moreland charges the mound. The bench is empty, and that was just the beginning. Later in the same game, Scott Sanderson retaliates. He hit Kelvin Chapman, and Sanderson got thrown out of the game. That upset Cubs fans. Game delayed for mop-up duty. The next day, Walt Terrell hits Bob Dernier. Terrell and Mets manager Davey Johnson are ejected. And then Lee Smith on course won the George Foster. Smith and manager Jim Fry get the heave-ho. Bottom line, Cubs sweep the four-game series. All right, Davey Johnson out, 7.22 to go. Is it a hopeless situation? No, it's not hopeless, but we have to win about five out of six, Lenny. And uh, my young pitchers, they got roughed up the last series, and they're really looking forward to the series. All right, how about the incidents from a month ago? What about what happened there? Will it affect what happens here this weekend? Well, I don't think it will. Uh, I know we're very up for it, and, uh, you know, we had to let out a little frustration, but uh, it was unfortunate. A couple guys got hit, and we had a little brawl, but nobody got hurt, and uh, we hope that doesn't happen here, but we hope what they did to us, we do to them. Did you have any kind of team meeting? Did you have any words of wisdom before this big series? No, they're sky high. They're ready to go. All right. Thank you, Davey. Lots of luck to you Thanks. right now. All right. Now. The story in the American League West, many of you will see the White Sox and Angels tonight. And the story there is another story of numbers. Interesting. The Angels trail the first place co-leaders, Kansas City and Minneapolis, by a half game. Chicago's only five games out. Last place, only eight and a half out. The entire division, it's anyone's race. When we come back, we'll talk about Cubs fans. We'll be back. Back at Shea Stadium in New York as we await the Mets and Cubs. Have you ever heard of the Emil Verbin Memorial Society? It's a group of Cubs fans around the country, the Emil Verbin Memorial Society. Emil played for the Cubs in the late 40s. They have some pretty famous members, 350 of them. Each member has a special number. Here are now some of the better known numbers. The Chicago Cubs are on their way to a National League pennant. Yeah. I have to tell you what that means to me personally. I was broadcasting the Cubs in 1935 when the only mathematical chance they had to win the pennant was to win the last 21 games of the season. And they did. And it still stands today as an unequal record. When I'm in the presence of such greatness, how can I feel intimidated by a little challenge like running for president? <laughs> Today's show host, Brian Gumbel at the Kremlin. Here in Moscow, I have managed to redefine frustration. Frustration is being the honorary president of the diehard Cubs fan club and being half a world away at their time of triumph. I mean, I have waited an entire lifetime waiting for the Cubs to win anything at all. And as you might suspect, my local Izvestia carries neither the box score nor the standings. In any event, it's time for me to get back to work. Hey, comrade. 215. Go Cubbies. Actor Tom Bosley in Hollywood. But the Cub fans are something very special. First of all, I think they're highly sophisticated. They don't know what winning is. They go home praising the fact that somebody hits a home run or somebody uh, is going to get a bat 300 for the year or drive in 100 runs. That's not the case this year. So much for the rich and famous. What about the bleacher bums who have suffered year after year in person? Got a big lead. They're printing playoff tickets. The magic number is in the paper every day. Who says it's in the bag? Two out of four. 
I'm shocked. What is it about Cubs fans that you just can't be confident at this point in the season? I'm confident, but it's not in the bag. Why? We, we all learned a very, very painful lesson in 1969. We got ourselves all psyched up for them to take the whole thing. And it was, it was a terrible letdown. It was a letdown that I can't even describe in words. It was, it was a terrible heartbreak. Um, it, it's just, let me put it this way. I, I think they're going to win their division. I'm pessimistically optimistic about it. What are the individual disasters you remember most over the past 15 years? I remember a series in New York in September, um, which we blew a couple games in, and a black cat happened to walk across the Cubs on deck circle during a, an important game. I said right away that something's wrong here, and this might not be our year after all. But it wasn't only the black cat at Shea in 69. It's as if the entire franchise has been star-crossed. After all, the last time this team won the World Series, Roosevelt was president. Teddy Roosevelt. I've been feeling each year that if I still hang in there, if all the Cub fans hang in there, that sooner or later it's going to happen. So I think just by pure odds, this has got to be the year, and we're not going to have a seven-game lead this late in the season and blow it. So as they try to extinguish the memory of Ghost's past, let's hear from the head Ghostbuster. I don't like to look at the standings until late in the year because uh, I've really had a lot of problems, and uh, I don't take work anymore in the fall. The guys who are playing for the Cubs, they don't look like the Cubs. They look like the guys that usually beat the Cubs. So I think we might get lucky. They don't look normal, these guys. Who can you call? Now, why do they call it the Emil Verbin Memorial Society? It's in memory of players such as Emil Verbin. It's not because he's dead. Emil Verbin is alive and well, living in Lincoln, Illinois, at the age of 69. It's time now for this week's home run hitting contest. Here's Bob Costas. NBC Sports and Major League Baseball present the Gatorade Super Slam. And today, it's a second-round match between two former Bay Area stars as Tony Armas, late of the A's and now with the Red Sox, takes on ex-giant Darrell Evans, who now plays with the Tigers. In his first-round match, Armas squeaked by Andre Thornton of the Cleveland Indians by the surprisingly low score of 3-1. to one. His opponent, Darrell Evans, accepted his teammates' congratulations after beating Cecil Cooper of the Brewers 6-2. Now the two are set to go head-to-head -head in a Motown showdown at Tiger Stadium in Detroit. It's a friendly park for home run hitters, but there's a possible problem for the right-handed swinging Armas. Evans, you see, is a left-handed hitter, and supposedly Tiger Stadium favors him. No big deal, says Darrell. You know, certainly if I was playing, hitting against Tony in uh, Boston, it'd be uh, a little tough, but uh, here, you know, it's pretty fair. Uh, I think I got an advantage down the line, but, but uh, he's got a little more advantage through the uh, alleys. And, uh, no, if you hit the ball, it's going to go. Well, Armas is the first to test the Evans theory of hitting, and you know, Darrell, you're right. When you hit the ball, it does go. In this case, very far. Now, as the match moves on, Evans is eager to show that he can reach the upper deck, too, and he responds with a tape measure blast of his own. After three innings, the score stands 3-2 in Armas's favor. After that, Tony becomes the Tiger as he sends batting practice pitcher Lee Stang's offering into orbit. Right there, Steve. Keep it there. Keep it where, Jim? Oh, I see. Right there. Yeah. Evans can only watch as Tony's two titanic shots give him a 5-2 lead, going to the bottom of the fifth and final inning. But Evans isn't ready to surrender. His third homer cuts Armas' lead down to 5-3 and leaves the crowd hoping for more. But despite what Darrell thinks on this try, number four isn't in store. Not just yet, anyway. This one bounced into the sands. Now, with the score still 5-3, Darrell connects once more. That makes it 5-4. But Evans thinks he's tied it up. Not so, Darrell. You're still one away. So now it's down to the final swing for Evans, and he fails to take it over the wall. So Tony Armas has come into Detroit and taken the Tiger by the tail, and as a result, he'll go on to face Dave Winfield of the Yankees in the next round. The winner of the Armas-Winfield match will face the winner of the Western Division draw. It's all coming up later this season. 
on NBC. We have a sad story to report tonight. Joe Cronin has passed away after a lengthy illness. Former American League president, MVP, Hall of Famer, Joe Cronin is dead today at the age of 77. Now, there was controversy this week in baseball. It happened at the vet in Philadelphia. It involved the Phillies and the Cubs and Al Oliver. Let's call it the great bat caper. Here it is. Here's the Phillies' Al Oliver batting against the Cubs. And while Oliver runs to first, catcher Jody Davis runs to Oliver's bat. And while Oliver legs out a double, Davis tells umpire Bruce Fremming the bat's illegal. Davis claimed the bat was corked. Illegal corking material drilled into the barrel. So umpire Fremming throws the bat out of the game. But he gives the evidence to the alleged perpetrators. Manager Paul Owens gives the bat to coach John Felsky, and they keep the bat for a full 62 seconds. The Cubs, of course, protest, and crew chief John Kibler confiscates the bat, sends it to the league headquarters, and the league says this bat is legal. But the question remains, is this bat that bat? Or did they pull the old switcheroo? Only the Phillies know for sure. And that'll do it for our pregame report. Coming up, the Mets and the Cubs from here at Shea Stadium in New York, or the Angels and White Sox from Comiskey. I'm Len Berman. Hope you enjoy the game tonight, everybody. It's coming your way right after this report from NBC. ...down to a precious few for the Cubs of September 1969 as the Mets fulfill the impossible dream. But in 1984, the Chicago Cubs come to Shea Stadium in September not looking at Tom Seaver, not looking at an ace who led the Mets to the World Series. Instead, the Mets are looking to a 19-year-old Dwight Gooden trying to get back into the pennant race. And the 84 Cubs say, never mind 69. NBC Sports presents a special edition of the Major League Baseball Game of the Week. Tonight from Shea Stadium, the Chicago Cubs versus the New York Mets. Tonight's game is brought to you by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? By Miller High Life, the best beer for the best time of the day. Welcome to Miller Time. By Commodore Computers. It's not how little you pay, but how much you get for the money. And by Castrol, motor oil engineered for today's smaller, higher revving engine. New York City on a magnificent evening you can smell the World Series. I'm Vin Scully along with Joe Garagiola and welcome to a big one. You can smell the World Series, but I also think that the Mets may be just hearing the hammer hit the nails on that coffin. They're realists. They know there's seven games out. I think two of the problems they have to worry about, Vin, is uh, one, not trying too hard to catch these Cubs, and the other one is that, uh, hey, nobody expected us to be here, and we've had a good year and kind of let the air out of the balloon. Well, that certainly does seem to be the theme in New York, of no matter what, it's as if they're preparing themselves for the doom, because most people seem to feel the Mets have to win all of them, the six remaining games with the Cubs. Do you feel that way? Well, I feel that they'll have to sweep it, because they got stung by the Cubs, and uh, they, they can't wait for anybody else to do it. They have to do it if they're going to do it. The Cubs have been a remarkable ball club, particularly at home, and the Mets have been only so-so on the road, and the Cubs still have about 13 games left at Wrigley Field. They're going to be very difficult to catch. They are a solid team. Well, that would sum it up. The New York Mets, the Chicago Cubs, will have the pregame stats and stories, the lineups, and the pregame story itself, all coming up right after this. Hi, I'm George Foster of the New York Mets. Every major leaguer has his own style of play. Some have speed, some have strength, and some have control. But one thing that's never in style is drugs. They won't make you faster, stronger, or help your control. 
So keep your own style. Don't be a yes man. Say no to drugs. This message was furnished by Major League Baseball in cooperation with the Players Association. Hi, I'm Dennis Secretary with the Chicago Cubs, and here's our lineup for tonight. Leading off is Bobby Denier. He's got good speed. Batting second, playing second base is Ryan Sandberg, who's the franchise. Batting third is the sergeant, Gary Matthews, playing left field. Batting fourth is the bull, Durham, playing first base. Batting fifth is Keith Moreland, Zonk, as we call him, playing right field. Batting sixth is the penguin, Ron Say, playing third base. Batting seventh is J.D. Jody Davis catching. Playing short is Bonesy Boa. Batting eighth and pitching is Rufus, Dick Ruthven, on the mound, right-hander. <laughs> you almost need an interpreter when those guys give the lineup. Here's the way the defense will line up for the Mets. Foster's in left, Wilson, and Strawberry. Ray Knight is at third base. Hubie Brooks has gone from third to short. Backman is at second base. Hernandez, a most valuable player candidate at first base. Fitzgerald is the catcher, and Gooden is the pitcher, and he has really been something. The New York Mets getting a standing ovation from a highly partisan crowd, and the 19-year-old phenom, Dwight Gooden, the youngster out of Tampa, Florida, who will not be 20 years old until the middle of November. And when you look at that, you can also add a couple of notes. He has won five straight. Here at Shea Stadium, he has won eight of those 14 and lost only two. His strikeout high, he struck out 14 Dodgers in May and just recently had another dozen Dodgers scalps the last time they came to New York. And I think especially with the shots you're looking at right now during the course of the evening, if he's got the good curveball, he usually has, it's just awesome. He overpowers you with his fastball, which you're watching right now. His curveball will back him out. He's very difficult to hit it from the right side. If there is a chink in his armor, it's holding men on, but then not many get on, so it's not a big chink. His, his rhythm is a little elaborate. You can see that kind of a high leg kick, and if the Cubs get aboard, they will run because the Cubs are very much of a running ball club with 135 stolen bases this year. One of the things about him that they say, too, is that when he gets a little bit tired, uh, his curveball breaks better. Now, that was a theory, and so they have started him warming up five minutes longer than usual so that he gets into that tired zone, let's call it that, a little bit earlier. But as his manager and everybody you talk to, barring injury, and let's hope that that doesn't happen, he's going to be around for a long time. He has great control, great confidence, I think the big mystery about him that he's only 19. Then. Only 19 and growing. Uh, David Johnson was telling us he has gained a good 10 pounds each of his last two years. He started 190. He's probably closer to 195 now. And he certainly has a couple of more years to fill out. He is the league strikeout leader with 224. And now he'll have to put it all on the line. And for the Chicago Cubs, things are just going swimmingly. They're not hitting well on this road trip, but their daily double of Denier and Sandberg, if they get aboard in the first inning, look out. And even though the Cubs are not hitting on this current road trip, they're hitting about 214, they have still managed to win six of eight. And they'll go home Monday and open up a 10-game homestand at Wrigley Field where they are almost unbeatable. So here we go. So the first one to fastball a little high. Frank Pulley is the plate umpire. Doug Harvey, Jerry Crawford, and Cowboy Joe West, the umpires for the series. 2 and 0. Oh. Davy Johnson saying the first few times he saw Gooden go 2 and 0 oh on a hitter, he'd back off the rubber because he couldn't believe he missed twice. He gets upset when he doesn't get that ball over. Uh, his poise is just tremendous. Two balls and no strikes to count. Right. You get the feeling, certainly here in New York, that Gooden must win. That if Gooden doesn't win, not only will the series unravel, but the rest of the year. If he doesn't win, get the buckets because the ship's going down. Two and one. Strike. Right. Though he's balanced his books, he is pitching against a man who is the best percentage of getting on base among all the leadoff hitters in the National League, Bob Denier. There you see his numbers, 50%. Curveball, and he just 
missed with it. Did you see that snake? That was really, as they say, Sir Charles. He doesn't throw Uncle Charlie. That is Sir Charles. A lot of respect when he throws that one. Now, a very big pitch for New York to keep the momentum for the Cubs to capture it. Foul away. We'll catch it during the night, but what happens here at Shea? You see the K's? Every time that Gooden gets two strikes on a hitter, K's pop up like mushrooms after a rainstorm. And up in the balcony, they will hang K's to illustrate numerically how many strikeouts he has in the game. So we have a battle going on here. Bob Dernier and Dwight Gooden. Three balls, two strikes. Ball four. And so the best leadoff man, successfully anyway on percentage, is aboard. You know he's going to be running. That's why it was a big pitch. The strikeout, of course, the momentum goes. Now the Cubbies may have something going because Sandberg usually gets a lot of fastballs to hit with Dernier on in first base. Here's a stat that you might find shocking. There have been 40 4-0 consecutive stolen bases off Dwight Gooden. Gooden has picked off three runners. Ball one to Sandberg. I asked Davey Johnson about calling for pitch outs, and he says, I'd rather not do that. I'd rather him go after the hitters, throw strikes. Don't worry about them. Do the best you can, but I don't particularly like to call pitch outs for him. Now keep an eye on Denier because he has 40 stolen bases. In fact, he's got a 71% ratio of success. That puts him way up high. And he wants to get a clear runway like a couple of cats trying to bury something down there. Well, they may have softened it up just a bit to try to help Dwight Gooden as we take a look at Dernier as he gets that little dance step. He gets set and then takes another one. One ball and no strikes. Dernier has stolen three off Gooden this year. And he is three for three against White. So Gooden starts off three and two and walks Dernier and he falls behind two and oh to Sandberg. And what do you think? You mean hitting or taking? Dernier, oh. no, Dernier. He's got to oh, be going yeah. here. Yeah, I would say this would be his pitch, man. There he goes. It's a strike and the throw. He's in there, so he is four for four against Dwight Gooden, and that means 41 consecutive stolen bases against the young right-hander. And it wasn't even close. Fitzgerald gets rid of the ball in good shape with that high kick, and the base on balls is now turned into a pretty much a two base hit there's the jump that he had with our high camera and look at that his hand is on the base when the ball is just getting there now ground ball to the right side a fly ball and you got yourself a run it's a manufactured one two and one to Ryan Sandberg leads the league in slugging percentage trying to go inside out but he got jammed Boy, I love to see that with the good hitters this kid he just does it all with everything else Number two behind Tony Gwynn. What a year for Ryan Sandberg. An incredible year when you think he hit 261 last year. He batting 321. Denier at second, nobody out. Now there's the first one. A fastball that got the inside part of the plate. And here come the K's. It was a fastball in the inside corner. He just couldn't pull the trigger. Frank Pulley did. So Gooden takes care of Sandberg and, just as importantly, kept Dunier at second base. Now he goes up against the Sarge, as they call him, Gary Matthews. Matthews hitting 295. He has 10 home runs, 69 runs batted in. Then while we got a chance here, you talked about the change in Sandberg hitting 261. It was interesting to hear Fry say the biggest offensive change has been Dernier. I thought it would be Sandberg coming off a 261 year, but not to his manager. On one to count to Gary Matthews. Of course, Dernier spent such a long time playing for Jim Fry and hitting well over 300. I'm not sure if he's hitting the skids or if he's just coming back the way he really belongs. Denier was hitting 284 at the start of the game. 0 and 1 to Gary Matthews. Up time call.
You can see Matthews is a kind of a busy hitter. That bat is constantly in motion. He gets up on that front foot. He gets up on his toe. And if you make him wait, you kind of neutralize him. No balls and one strike to Gary Matthews. Well, now with two strikes on him, the K's pop up again. Matthews has hit good and hard this year. Four for nine. First inning, no score. Bob Dunier walked, stole second, Sandberg struck out. And the count 0 and 2 to Gary Matthews. Kind of interested in that pitch because he threw two fastballs by him. Would he be throwing him a fastball or go to the curveball? No way you can guess against Gooden. You just hope that you can see the ball. But if there was ever a right time for a curveball, this would be it. Wasn't that an interesting thing that Davy Johnson was talking about how Gooden judges back speed and pitches accordingly? If he's in near the zone, you're going to be swinging this way out of it high. And he was just late on it. And it was uh, interesting what Davey Johnson talks about, that he watches the batters as young as he is. And if a batter swings too soon, he adjusts to that. If he swings late and fouls went off, good and adjust to that. That usually comes with tremendous years of experience. He's gained it early. Well, we take a look at the brand new daddy, Leon Durham, ball one. By the way, Dwight Gooden now is one strikeout away from the National League rookie strikeout record. Grover Cleveland Alexander had 227 back in 1911. Dwight needs one to tie, but the difference, the number of innings, and the difference is incredible. Ground ball to the left side. Hubie Brooks, who's playing short these days, throws him out. No runs, no hits. One man left at the end of half an inning. The Cubs nothing. Mets coming up. 84 Mets, hopefully champions of the National League East. My leadoff hitter is Wally Bachman. He's an outstanding hitter. He'll take a strike to get on base. My number two hitter is Mookie Wilson. He's a center fielder. My number three hitter is my MVP of the year, Keith Hernandez. He plays first base. My number four hitter is a sophomore player, outstanding player. Daryl Strawberry, and he's in right field. My fifth hitter probably is the best hitter I've had since the All-Star break, and he plays left field, George Foster. My sixth hitter is the guy that's made a transition from third base, Hubie Brooks, and having an outstanding year. Following him is my third base, and we just acquired a couple weeks ago, outstanding player in Ray Knight. And following him is my catcher, Mike Fitzgerald, an outstanding player. Also, has done a good job for a first-year player. And Dwight Gooden, a 19-year-old sensational strikeout pitcher who's going to be around for a long time. Words coming out of the mouth of Davy Johnson as Wally Backman triples on the first pitch. It was just a fastball. He was going to get ahead of him, and Backman stayed right with it, and he hit it a long way. Usually he's bunting and kind of clawing and scratching for the base hit. He hit this one pretty solidly. I love Davey Johnson, and giving the lineup, he said, my leadoff man is Wally Backman. He will take a strike to get on base. If Backman walks up, and before his manager's finished giving the lineup, he snaps an 0-for-13 slump with a triple. Ball one off speed to Mookie Wilson. Say is in on the grass at third. Everybody else a normal depth. Dick Ruthen out on the mound as Mookie waits. Bowed away. Ruthven is the only Cub pitcher below 500. Dick is five and nine. He is one and two against the Mets. Twelve and nine lifetime. It's been a tough year for him. He had shoulder surgery, and of course the Cubs are delighted to get him back. He's had tough luck. It's the fourth start he's made against Dwight Gooden this year. Change fouled off. One thing about Mookie, when he was the leadoff man for the New York Mets last year, he walked only 18 times. So they said, that's no good. We'll put him in the number two slot. 
You know how many times he's walked this year? 18 times. <laughs> it doesn't make any difference where you put him. He's hacking. Little looper to right center field. Moreland and Dernier. It is Moreland tagging his backman. He will score. So Wally Backman triples. Mookie Wilson picks him up with a fly ball. His 42nd RBI. And the Mets lead one to nothing. He had a pretty good pitch. It was a curveball. He didn't really have a good home run swing at it, but he got enough of it, and Moreland was running away from the place he had to throw to, which made it easy for Backman to score. Here now is Keith Hernandez. You heard Davey Johnson refer to him as his MVP, and you can see his numbers there. He has an 11-game hitting streak and certainly an outside chance in the remaining number of games to have his second 100 RBI season. One thing about Keith, and he's distracted by the airplane flying overhead, and you'll hear that all night. Hernandez has a great knowledge of the strike zone. He has walked 94 times this year. Those 94 it puts him number one in the league. Gary Matthews is number two. Speed two and one the count. And apparently Hernandez, as you look at the stats, Hernandez has done a good job in that clubhouse helping the young fellas come through this pennant drive. And he laces it to left center, Denier on the dead run and makes the catch. Bob had a good jump on that. It was here at Shea Stadium where the Mets suddenly went below the waves on a Friday night way back in July. The Mets had beaten the Cubs. Gooden was the pitcher on the 27th of July. And the Mets led by four and a half games. And the next day we worked the game, Joe. Denier dropped a fly ball in center field. Right. It looked like the Mets were going to have more magic. And the Cubs just ripped the game apart and went on to beat the Mets seven straight times. Ball one to Strawberry. So actually they come in here and that's a swing of 11 and a half games. Since the end of July. From four and a half back to seven in front. Off speed, ball two. And Davey talks about that because how it affected his young pitchers that they kind of got defensive and tried to hit those corners instead of coming right at him. And he's told them for this series, just go get them. And Ruthven now is behind three and zero. Oh. The pitching for the series tomorrow: Rick Sutcliffe and Walt Terrell. And then on Sunday, Scott Sanderson and Ron Darling. Pass ball in there, three and one. Strawberry is 6'6", six, six, about 190. He's only 22, so he's another kid who's going to get a little bigger. Check, did he swing? He swung, so they call him back. Third base umpire, Joe West. Caught Strawberry swing. It's almost a duplicate of what we saw when uh, we were here last time and Davey Johnson got kicked out of the game. What and do you think? There you go. Ground ball up along first foul. I love baseball managers. You and I walk in the clubhouse. Davey Johnson looks up and says, oh, great. The last time you were here, I lasted four batters. Right. That's just what he thinks of. Meanwhile, you see Billy Connors, the pitching coach, and Jim Fry. Three and two to Darrell Strawberry. One nothing Mets first inning. High fly ball to left center field. Matthews and Denier. Denier says he'll take care of it. He's the captain out there, and that's that. One run on a triple by Bachman and a fly ball by Wilson. Baseball's pennant race is heating up, and you can see it all tomorrow. Here's a preview. The American tradition continues. Reggie Jackson leads his veteran California Angels squad into Chicago, where the White Sox try to recapture the American League West championship. Or the front-running Tigers take on the Toronto Blue Jays. The tradition is here on the home of the World Series. There you 
Jesse Gooden is one behind Grover Cleveland Alexander the American League record Herb score the point we wanted to make Alexander got his strikeouts in three hundred and thirty seven innings Gooden has done it in one hundred and eighty five strike to Keith Moreland. There's so much you have to like about this youngster but his attitude is just a one. This winter he wants to go to the instructional league. He lives in Tampa. They have an instructional league. The Mets do in St. Petersburg. He wants to work on his change. Oh boy, that's all he needs. One more pitch. That's in there. If you joined us a little late, Bob Denier opened up with a walk and stole second. Gooden then struck out Sandberg and Matthews. Got Durham on a ground ball, and now he's starting off the second inning 0 and 2 on Moreland. Hit down the right field line, foul, and out of play. In his delivery, he doesn't really watch that plate all the way. Watch this as he gets ready to deliver. He's got the sign. Looks down, picks it up, looks down, and away, and here he comes. You don't think that's a little intimidating as hard as he throws? You want to say, over here, here's where I am. And don't look away. Fouled away, and he really busted one in on the hands. Zonk, as they call him, really had to fight off a mean pitch. He's thrown one curveball so far. Moreland having a marvelous year. As we mentioned, one big reason they let him play every day because of the Sutcliffe trade. One and two. And it looked like Gooden was trying to pitch beyond himself, trying to get a little something extra. That's the first awkward delivery he made tonight. One and two little wave building behind him in the stand. Two and two. Hernandez, Bachman, Brooks, and Knight on the infield. Foster, Wilson, Strawberry in the outfield. And Mike Fitzgerald behind the plate. Two and two. up around Keith's eyes. That fastball really exploded. Uh, I tell you, when he gets two strikes on you, he's awesome, and that fastball, uh, you're going to protect that plate, and by the time you commit yourself, it's just too late. It's way out of the strike zone. So that's it. That's an important strikeout. There it is. Averaging 10.9. The record is 10.7. Sam McDowell did that. Uh, this kid is truly phenomenal, and of course, with the three, he is tied Grover Cleveland Alexander. Remarkable. Right. Another tribute to his ability is that they really do not have meetings. He just goes by bat speed. They want him to throw hard, throw in the strike zone, and he himself adjusts. And you can see he shakes off his catcher. He's got confidence in his pitches, and he's going to pitch his own game. And what about this hitter? Is that the toughest 234 you ever saw? Mm. His batting average? Say with 25 home runs, 88 RBIs, Ronnie is up there with two bad wrists, and the other day he fouled a ball off an ankle. But he's hurting from three of the four extremities, and he's still got a way to go. It doesn't hurt quite as much when you're leading by seven. Boy, they're strikeout crazy here at Shea whenever this kid is pitching. The Cubs, meanwhile, they are such a good, solid ball club. They just roll along against every team in the league. No one has an edge on them. They're consistent at home and on the road. Two and two. Oh, baby, did you see that one? It just rolled off the table. You talk about a curveball. I don't know about physics and all that kind of stuff, but look at this thing snap off. That is a nasty snake. Public enemy number one, and the count two and two. And another one missed. And boy, Frank Cooley, his elbows hit his rib cage. The plate umpire flinched on that one. Yeah, he faked him out. <laughs> Three and two. Hang in there, Frank. to the camera and in the middle that handsome young profile Peter Uberoff soon to be the commissioner of baseball and look at the candies <laughs> they've gone crazy 
He has struck out four, so he is number one for a rookie in the National League, and of course they know all about it here. And this is only the second inning. One nothing New York, by the way. You think these fans are going to be able to make it for nine? Here's another note on him. Gooden leads the National League in striking out the side. He has struck out the side 12 times this year. And of course, he's gotten Moreland and Say, and he's 0 and 1 on Davis. Nope, fly ball to right field, and Strawberry is there. Every time he walks out, he's a potential for the no hitter. Isn't that something? At the end of an inning and a half, the New York Mets won, and the Chicago Cubs nothing. Week. It'll be the Tigers and the Blue Jays and the Angels and the White Sox. The American League West has certainly come alive. And meanwhile, Toronto still feels they have a shot at it. In the pregame show, Tony Armas of Boston pounds it out against Darrell Evans of Detroit in the Gatorade Super Slam home run contest. All tomorrow, beginning at 2 p.m. Eastern Time on NBC Sports, the home of the 1984 World Series. And by the way, in talking about Detroit, Toronto, in the bottom of the fifth inning, Toronto four and Detroit nothing. George Foster, then Hubie Brooks, and Ray Knight. <laughs> the four strikeout victims already, cup busters. I like Bill Murray's line in the pregame show. He says, the guys that are playing for the Cubs now always look like the other guys that used to beat them. <laughs> <laughs> well, Big George having a good year. 19 home runs, 73 RBIs. Strike. Foster is hit in nine of his last ten. Dick Ruthman working to Jody Davis, trying to get him. An infield of the Cubs since we didn't have a chance to really set it for you. Leon Durham is at first. Ryan Sandberg at second. Larry Boa is at short. And Ron Say at third. Gary Matthews, Bob Dunier, and Keith Moreland in the outfield. Oh and two the count of George. He'd be followed by Hubie Brooks and then Ray Knight. So strikeouts are contagious. Dick Ruthman has as rhythmical a delivery, I think, as I've ever seen. When his hands come together, watch him bounce. See that? That little. I would think that helps the hitter. Does it? Well, it could be distracting. It could help it if you could time him, but yeah. it'd be very difficult to time. And he's also another pitcher, as you notice in that delivery, who looks away from the plate when he's delivering. And that, to me, is always a big intimidation factor. Dick working now on Hubie Brooks. Fouled away. Hubie has been playing third base for the Mets. Back in 1981, they pressed him into service. And he played three innings against the Giants in May of 81. But then the Mets have had a lot of trouble at shortstop. And once Ray Knight was acquired, they moved Hubie to short because they had lost Ron Gardenhier. Then they lost Rafael Santana. And they had sent Jose Oquendo out anyway. And so Brooks is now a shortstop, and they're thinking about making him a shortstop. They're talking about sending him to the Arizona Instructional League. The Mets were nowhere last year, as you know. In fact, they had company, neither were the Cubs. But Brooks last year might have been the least known hero around. He had the best average in the National League last year with runners in scoring position. You could win a few bets on that one. Good player. He's another one of Jim Brock's boys from ASU. Good brand of baseball. One and two. Popped in the air, fouled and out of play. Talking about Ruthven's delivery, watch his eyes now. Right there, if you're the hitter, you want to holler again. I'm over here, man. Looking away or otherwise, Ruthman is pitching well. He's won his last two starts. One and two. Ground ball wide a third. Big hop for Say at the last minute, and he gets him. So Brooks taps to third. Two down in the second inning. Ron Say, bad wrists and a sore ankle. The Penguin 
Nice. Playing great ball for the Cubs. One big reason why they are where they are. And the prospects are so interesting to have Say and Lopes on one team and Steve Garvey on the other if they wind up in the playoff. Like some Chicago writers, Ron Rappaport and Bob Verde were saying somehow they ought to get Bill Russell to play so they can get that whole infield in the playoff. Strike to Ray. He was acquired the end of August 28th to be exact. And he's played every day. They got him for three Class A players. They've named two of them and one other to be named later. I think Houston just felt that Ray suddenly grew old in a hurry. One and one. Two home runs, 31 RBIs. His best year was when he replaced Pete Rose in 1979. He finished third in the batting race that year behind Keith Hernandez and Pete Rose. And when he goes out on a Sunday to play golf with his wife, he's got no chance of winning. No chance. He's going to be your caddy. One and two to Ray. Foul tipped in hell. So Dick Ruthven comes right back and strikes out two. And at the end of two, the Mets one run, one hit. And the Cubs, no runs, no hits. We'll be back after these messages from your local station. A bird's eye view from our camera high atop Shea Stadium. And we'll take you right down to the mound. Magnificent piece of technology, isn't it? Progress, progress. So Dwight Gooden ready to go to work. He has struck out four. The Mets are leading the Cubs one to nothing. And Larry Boa hitting 215 will start off the third inning. Popped it in the air around the plate. Coming down is Hernandez. Coming across is Ray Knight. And Knight almost stepped on the bat. That bat could have been a problem. But all three men avoided it. Fitzgerald, a very smart catcher. He saw it go up and he hollered a lot of room and waited for his first or third baseman to get it. That's a tough play for him. Here's the high camera. Now Hernandez thinks he's going to make the play. And Knight cuts right across him. And look at the bat where it is. Makes the play. So with one away here in the third inning, here's Dick Ruthman coming up. Ruthven has seven hits this year and a couple of RBI going one. You know, in doing a little research on the Cubs and the Mets, it's no big deal. And yet, it's oh, yes, it is. It's, well, okay, it's a big deal. No, it's not. <laughs> but it is a little surprising. I'll tell you why. One nothing men, third inning. The Cubs are the home run hitting team. They score a lot of runs. They play in small or smaller Wrigley Field. All right, if you looked at the Cubs and sacrifices, bunts, and if you look at the Mets, sacrifices and bunts, you figure, of course, that pitchers are going to sacrifice a lot. So let's forget the pitching staff for either team. One and two. Which team would you think sacrifices more, plays for one run, bunts? Sure, but that's not true. It's the Cubs. Really? Yeah. Strikeout number five. He just snapped that one off, and Ruthman couldn't do nothing but genuflect. Watch this. You talk about an equalizer. That's an overhand curveball. As a kid, you call that as a, a drop, and as a batter, you want to look for the classified section and go to air conditioning school. It's just a neutralizer. Unhittable. 19. Huh. Fouled away. Off to the right, out of play, 0-1. Bob Denier, and we mentioned it before, I'm not sure if he's really in a slump or if it's a law of average bringing him down to where he really belongs. He was hitting 300 and more, but see his numbers have drifted him back down to 283. 0-1. Strike. That curveball strike you threw the roof and was the best he's thrown as far as the break on it and the location. So it looks like he's in the curveball groove. 0 oh, and 2. Breaking ball is right, but he got it too low. But if you're going to miss, of course, with a curveball, that's where to miss with it. I tell you, you can look for that curveball and not do anything with it. 
And he's going to work on a changeup, huh? That's what they said. Yeah. They're reporting. Move to a higher league. Little foul out of play. And it was another breaking ball. One and two. Remember, Denier went three and two with Gooden in the first inning. And then Bob battled and got the walk and immediately stole second. It's one nothing Mets, top of the third inning. After this three game series, the Cubs go home and boy, they are murder in Wrigley Field. 45 and 23 at home. Breaking ball miss. Two and two. The Cubs will pay Philadelphia, Montreal, and then the Mets again. After not throwing many curveballs, Fitzgerald has called for three in a row. Well, let's see. Two and two. Will it be the Express or the Breaking Ball? Fastball got it. So he picks up a half a dozen strikeouts in three innings. And at the end of two and a half innings, the Mets won and the Cubs nothing. Third inning at Shea Stadium in New York. The Mets leading the Cubs one to nothing. Dick Ruthven and Dwight Gooden. And a wave cheer begins. It's a cool wave. Temperatures have been absolutely beautiful in New York. Breaking ball for a strike, 0 and 1. Mike Fitzgerald, Dwight Gooden, and Wally Backman. We can duck in to score. The California Angels 2, the Chicago White Sox nothing. That's top of the second inning. We'll be at Comiskey Park tomorrow. 0 and 1. One ball, one strike. Ruthven, more of a finesse pitcher in direct contrast to that blazing stuff that Gooden has. Most anybody's going yeah. to look slow by comparison. One and one. Ball two, two and one. Watching Jody Davis give the signs, at least on the first couple, he was using what they're sometimes called nighttime signs. If flat hand was the fastball. If you saw the uh, palm go up, it was the breaking ball. Ground ball to the left, a shortstop, under Boa's glove and through in the left center field. And Fitzgerald, who has been swinging a much better bat of late, hitting 241 at the start of the night. And here's the way it looked if you were Larry Boa coming right at you. Boa tried to get over there and just doesn't get to it. Mike Fitzgerald is not threatening the league, but he is sure wearing out Cub pitching. He's hitting 340 against Chicago pitching. And the batter now is Dwight Gooden. And he gets his bunt to first, and Durham will tag him. And into second base goes Fitzgerald. Gooden, as you might gather, is a good bunter. Nine sacrifices for him. So at 19, the only real flaw so far is the fact he is slow coming to the plate and the run is steel on him. He just hasn't had enough practice. He's got to walk more guys in practice. What a wonderful chink to have in your armor. But you, you don't hold runners on and they don't get on, though. Here's Wally Backman who hit the first pitch by Dick Ruth and up the alley for a triple to right center and scored the only run of the game in the first inning. Running underneath a big slow curveball. One ball, no strikes to Backman. He's had about two years in the big leagues out of Beaverton, Oregon. And came into the game hitting 275, but he does the bulk of his hitting as a left handed batter, and he's hitting about 290 from this side of the plate. No power. They play him shallow, especially with a runner at second and one out. Two balls and no strikes. Gerald single sacrificed by Gooden Backman trying to pick him up. Here's that situation to take a strike. And he did just that. That's Ray Knight talking to his manager Davey Johnson. Sacramento. He's 
is 33 years old. He's been pitching in the big leagues since 1974. Backman has good discipline. He knows that strike zone. A base on balls here would really be a big one because then you got the big guys, Wilson, Hernandez, Strawberry coming up. Three balls, one strike. Fouled away. How well have the Cubs been playing? Well, on this trip, they've won six out of eight. They've won 10 of their last 12. The day before yesterday, the Mets won and the Cubs lost and it was the first time that the Mets were able to pick up a game on the Cubs since August 22nd. The Cubs have just been sailing along and they now enjoy a seven game lead the largest in the National League East this year. Three and two. Series in 1969 with Baltimore. They had over 57,000. I don't believe they have anything like that, but they should be over 50 at least. Jim Fry never played in the big leagues. Boy, what a job he did in Kansas City, and now what a job he's doing in Chicago. And the batter, Mookie Wilson, who had the scoring fly ball in the first inning. Two on, one out, one nothing Mets in the third. One and oh. I tell you, if you would have seen the Cubs in spring training, you wouldn't have given 20 cents for a chance at anything. They no. really had a terrible spring. They lost 11 straight. And the way they were losing, I mean, fly balls went up. It was an adventure. I mean, they just would say, oh, there it is. It's up there. And then, boop, it would drop. One and all to Mookie. Fastball in there. You know, at one time they had more fights than they had victories. They had three fights and two wins. And you know, Jim Fry would smile and he'd say three fights, and he said reported. <laughs> <laughs> one ball and one strike to Mookie with two on and one out on the third. One nothing match. That's hit into left center field, and it's in there for a base hit. In come Fitzgerald. Mookie going for two to throw to Sandberg gets away. Here comes Backman to score. Gets it in there. It looks like they're going to have a play. And right there is when uh, Backman at third base, he makes his own decision as the throw goes in the second, and he heads for the plate and makes it easily. I would think they would have to give Sandberg the error. It hit him right in the glove. Jim Fry going out to the mound. We'll check with the scoring. But it looked like Sandberg wanted to catch it and make a tag and came up with a handful of empty. Good base running. Uh, Valentine, the coach at third base, and Backman, they pick up another run. We know it's an error to get Backman in for the moment at least. We're waiting, and now they say it is Sandberg's error. It looked that way. So the Mets, who need some momentum, they need a psychological lift. After all, they have just lost three of their last four. They're seven games back. Warren Brewster throwing down in the bullpen. And the Mets have the boost, at least in the early going, 3 0. But of course, the way the Cubs have played this year, they can explode without a moment's notice. And the last time we were here at Shea to see the Cubs, they did just that on the 28th of July. So Mookie Wilson picks up one RBI. He's at second base with a base hit in the error charge to Sandberg. Still only one out. And Keith Hernandez with an 11 game hitting streak and no pitch. Time call by Frank Cooley. By the way, as you look at Warren Brewster throwing in the pen, that error charge to Sandberg breaks a string. Ryan had gone 61 consecutive games without an error the longest of any second baseman in the league and it's only his fifth error of the year that's a strike 
and that was an aggressive error. I mean, he could have safety first that and made sure he caught it and then made the tag, but he had to do the quick job, the short hop, and it cost him, but it was an aggressive error. It was his fifth, as we said. Joe Morgan holds a major league record, fewest errors for a second baseman, five, and now Sandberg is tied with him. On one. One and one to Hernandez. Mets three runs, three hits. Cubs no runs, no hits. If you have not been with us, the first three innings, young Dwight Gooden has struck out six. Wilson waiting to be picked up. Oh, good pitch. One and two. Effectiveness of that curveball, the key is the change of speed. It's so much slower than his fastball. There's a lot going on between these two, Ruthven and Hernandez. A little fisted job, foul off third, down the line, out of play. Keith will have to get another bat. I think he might have cracked the handle. No, he's all right. Here's the point about Hernandez and Ruthven. First of all, Hernandez is hitting 372 against Chicago pitching. He has seven RBIs and two home runs, and both of those home runs off Dick Ruthven. In fact, the 100th career home run was against Ruthven. One and two. Two balls, two strikes. Like everything else that Ruthven does with rhythm and so deliberate, even his set position, he holds the ball far out from his body which probably helps the runner at second, but it would be very tough for the runner at first. And he got a good runner because Mookie Wilson has stolen 42 bases. Watch how he holds that ball out from his body, unless he buries. No, he holds it there. It, it's a comfort zone for him. Two and two. Right there. Off speed. I wonder if you were Wilson, do you think you could? I know you couldn't help the hitter. You wouldn't have enough time. You see whether he's holding the ball on the seams, across the seams. I'm you sure could read, you, could. you could. You could read the grip, couldn't you? From second base. You yeah. Could. Watch this. Another foul off third. Say coming over. No play. California Angels who have really been struggling but are suddenly very much alive chewing up the White Sox eight nothing in the second inning. Ruthven has made two good pitches to Hernandez and he's been able to fight him off and that's what the good hitter does. He fights him off and stays alive. Both fastballs in on his fist. There's a good read. Trust Still only seems. one out. and not stopping in the belt buckle. I wonder why he would make a man do that. It seems unorthodox. What feels comfortable? That's the way a coach at first base usually watches the pitcher. How does he go into that glove? High fly ball to shallow right. Moreland started back on it, but it's high enough to recover and shallow enough to keep Wilson at second base. So Hernandez just a lazy fly ball to right. Two down, third inning, three nothing men. Before Strawberry hits, a reminder this telecast presented by Authority of Major League Baseball may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. Darrell Strawberry applied to center in the first inning. They're going to take the bat right out of his hand. They'll walk him intentionally and go after Foster, right-hander versus right-hander. Also, you get a force play to get out of the inning. And just to add to that, Strawberry's been a hot hitter. Well, and it looked like Ruthven had pretty good control of that man, Foster, his last time up. If you remember, he struck him out, but he struck him out with the fastball in tight, so he could go either way with his fastball or breaking ball. Struck him out with the fastball, but set him up with the curveball strike. Now, I was just thinking, what a difference a year makes. One year ago, the Mets and the Cubs 
were the only teams not in the race in the National League East. And that is one of the most often asked questions of Jim Fry. You say, could you think in January and February that you and the Mets would be battling in a pennant race? Foster, as you see, three of his hits have been home runs. And he has hit them against Trout, Sutcliffe, and Brewstar. But he's hitting less than 230 against Chicago pitching. Now that's another reason, I guess, why they decided to bypass Strawberry. George 0 for 1. 3 0 Mets in the third inning. And he hits one into left center field deep, and this one is gone. So much for strategy. His fourth home run. Against Chicago, and it is six to nothing, men. pitcher below 500 he has had a lot of problems this year and he finds himself down six nothing in the third inning and Jim Fry is down six nothing to Dwight Gooden you see John Vukovic Ruben Amaro Jim Fry and pitching coach Billy Connor of course it'd be easy to jump on Fry and saying you know they walked him he got Foster mad and all that which of course is just it's ridiculous to even give it a thought because Strawberry a left hand hitter he had Ruthven had an easy time of Foster and you could see what Jim Fry was thinking but Ruthven trying to get that ball in got it out over the plate and Foster is able to do what he did hit the ball out of the ballpark. We have time as they spray Hubie Brooks shin to duck in another score bottom of the second inning Seattle won Kansas City won. And the wave has hit Shea Stadium. is still not quite ready. Nope, he can't make it yet. And a beach ball is on the field. Tell you, it may hurt him, but if he tops one down the third base line, the express trip to Lourdes, he'll fly down to first base. <laughs> I was just going to ask you if you thought it was real or not. Two and two. It'll be real tonight, but if it's a base hit in sight, oh boy, instant cure. Two and two, the count of UB Brooks. Six nothing match here in the third. Three and two. Warren Brewster is pitching a ball game behind Ruthman, and that was not a knockdown pitch. That was just a breaking ball that stayed up. Nothing intimidating about that. Three and two. Fastball away. 
So Hubie Brooks walks. That means Ray Knight will be the ninth man to come up in the third inning. At the plate, third baseman. All eyes on the Chicago Knight. dugout, but Jim Fry is not coming out. And now here he comes. Rick Sutcliffe was sitting on the steps charting the pitches. He goes tomorrow against Walt Terrell. So we will have a pitching change and Dick Ruthven gives up six and he's not out of the woods yet. Six nothing Mets were in the third. We'll be back after this. We're still in the third inning. It is a five run third and the Mets leading the Cubs six to nothing. Six runs, four hits, and look at those four hits. And the Cubs, no runs, no hits. And George Forster, of course. <laughs> Hit a home run, brother. It makes you do a lot of strange things. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a big one. Of course, for the Cubs and Jim Fry. They're not very happy over there, but certainly it's a consoling thought to Fry. Even if he loses tonight, he'll go to bed leading by six. That's not a bad number to hang around with at this stage. Warren Brewstar has been pitching very well. In fact, he's allowed only one earned run in his last ten innings. And he'll be picking up the pieces now and hoping that his Cub hitters can come alive against Dwight Gooden. It's been a long inning. Gooden's been on the bench a long time. Well, Ray Knight will check in against Bruce Star. And he probably hits it to dead center, and dead's a good word for it. Denier is going to bury it, and that's it. However, it's a five run third. There were three hits, including an error. The big blow, the home run by George Foster. 6 nothing met. NBC Sports, a big NFL doubleheader coming this Sunday. We've got time, so here's a preview. Dwight Gooden, and if you're keeping score, you might want to do what we're doing up here. Gooden, in three innings, has made 44 pitches, 28 of them strikes, 16 balls. He has faced 10 men. Seven first pitch strikes. That's what I call in control. He is in control, but we should also point out Ryan Sandberg, Gary Matthews, and Leon Durham coming up. The Cubs have a team batting average of 264. They're number one in the league in runs scored, second in home run. So he's talented and he's got something going. No hits through three innings, but the Cubs are explosive. Sandberg has 66 extra base hits, number one man in the league. One of the turning points in this season, Jim Fry was making the point of it because another one of the questions often asked is uh, what game or what pitch. It was when Sandberg hit the home run off Suter to tie it not only once but twice. He said that seemed to turn it around. One ball and one strike. Boy, you talk about smoke city. When you can make that glove that Fitzgerald's using pop, you are throwing hard because that thing is like a pillow. It is not the kind that would just tend to make it pop. One and two to Ryan. Fastball got him looking. That's seven strikeouts for Dwight Gooden. Or to put it another way. Ten outs have been recorded, and seven of the ten have been strikeouts. Sandberg caught looking twice. Boy, he just sprays your bat rack with termites. Oh, here's Gary Matthews. He struck out. Ball one. It's so early in the game, and you already start talking about the people who hit the ball. Durham grounded out. Davis flied out. And Boa fouled out. All the other outs came. Fouled away. One and one. When you see a, a young player like a Ryan Sandberg, or you see a young player like a Dwight Good, you really pray that they will stay well and uh, healthy and grow because the sky's the limit. Right. High fly ball to right center. Wilson and Strawberry, and Mookie says he'll take it. 
You imagine in about four years when he walks into Nelson Doubleday and says, what do you say, partner? partner. <laughs> and he'll really mean it. What are we publishing this week? What would you like to do for your job, Nelson? <laughs> Mets six, Cubs nothing, two out on the fourth. Leon Durham. Grounded to short in the first inning. Big day in his life when the Cubs were in Atlanta. And his wife Angela presented him with a bouncing baby girl. Two and all the count. Another thought. You throw as hard as Gooden does, but you're only 19 and the world is your oyster. Suppose he got the meanness of a Bob Gibson. And maybe meanness isn't the right word, but you know, he doesn't look aggressive. He's just a nice kid out there who happens to throw the ball hard. But what about in a couple of years when he starts to well, you just up a little? You just don't know how aggressive he is until you you're in that batter's box because he may look nice. Ground ball to first, backhanded by Hernandez. He goes to the bag, and for four innings at least, Dwight Gooden has not allowed a hit. And at the end of three and a half innings, the Mets six and the Cubs nothing. Clear night in New York. The moon looks like you could reach up and pluck it. That's the way the ball looks to a 300 hitter, and now you see 280. 260, 240, <laughs> and that's the way that sucker looked to me right there. Right there. <laughs> well, we see now about Warren Brewster on his own here in the bottom of the fourth inning. Six to nothing in favor of the Mets. Remember, they sent nine men to the plate. So Mike Fitzgerald opened it up with a single in the third. third another bad hop and say stays with it dug out nicely by Durham good play by Ronnie that thing exploded boy he almost got that in the mustache yes he did he made a good play it's the last bounce it really it's a wicked one watch it he's got it and then whoops look at here right in the weapon Well, the old pro Frank Crosetti always said anybody can catch a good hop. The good players make the bad hop plays. Ron certainly turned into Danny there. And now here's Dwight Gooden. You can see the right wrist is heavily taped. He has a bone chip there. He has strained ligaments in the left wrist. That's taped. And he has a bad ankle. Otherwise, he's in great shape. <laughs> One and one. Boys have nicknamed his wrists Johnson and Johnson. Six nothing New York in the fourth. But the big story right now is the kid at the plate, Dwight Gooden. We're kidding about Nelson Doubleday. Fred Wilpon, one of the other owners in the next booth, he heard us. He leaned over. He said it may not take four years. It'd be two years. He'll be a partner. And there's what he has done so far: seven strikeouts. Hits one down the right field line, foul, and out of play. Checking his bat, and he'll have to get another. You mentioned Bob Gibson before. I thought it was quite a compliment when they compared Gooden to Gibson and asked him about it. He said, no comparison, because when I was 19, I was all over the place. His control is so great. There's so much building here, not only the Mets trying to get back in the race, Gooden with all of his strikeouts and working on a no-hitter for four innings. Two and two. Out away. You might wonder about Gooden, how close has he come to pitching a no-hitter? The longest he has gone this year without giving up a hit. He went into seven innings against Pittsburgh. It was way back in June, and Doug Froebel had a leadoff single to break the spell. Ground ball to the right side, in the right field. I'll tell you the way he looks tonight, he must be dressing in a telephone booth. 
Take that shirt off, and there's a big S. That's where it is. He's doing it all, I'll tell you. And another phenomenon here. I, I read it once, but I didn't believe it. They say that there's so much noise in the ballpark, you don't hear the planes. You really don't. No. That's right. Either that or the wind has shifted, and they're taking off and landing in a different direction. The one-out bottom of the fourth, six to nothing Mets. Here's Wally Backman, who opened up the game. He hit Dick Ruthman's first pitch for a triple and scored on a fly ball by Mookie Wilson. Ball one. When the Cubs hit in the fifth inning, they'll have Keith Moreland, Ron Say, and Jody Davis. Backman scored his second run when the throw got away from Ryan Sandberg. Ball two. Warren Brewstar picking up for Dick Ruthen, who is charged with all six runs. First base coach, and you saw the way he was gripping that ball was with the seams. Was a fastball? You'd make a note of that. And you'd say, "Well, let's see if he grips it with the seams and throws another fastball." That's Bill Robinson who's looking and checking everything out from first base. And he's walking. So Wally Backman walks for the second time, which is understandable if you're five nine and you bend at the knees and waist, you really shrink the strike zone. And with two on and one out, Mookie Wilson will come out. Mookie had the scoring fly ball, single, and came home on Foster's home run in the third inning. seems you see and coach will just make a note of that and see what the pitch is I'm dug in a couple of scores here as we watch that grip top of the fifth inning Texas one Minnesota one and top of the fourth Seattle one Kansas City one and of course they're tied for first place Kansas City and Minnesota the Angels meanwhile a half a game back they're winning big in Chicago same grip going into the glove, and that's important to remember. Ground ball going into right field. Here comes Gooden to the plate. He will score. Down to third goes Backman, and it is 7-0 New York. So Mookie has three RBIs. He's got a lot. Gooden scores fairly easy. I mean, big long strides. He makes a big wide turn. Here he comes. He didn't even hesitate. Now he sees the throw coming towards the plate, but he beats it easily. So it is all New York. We're in the fourth inning with one out. The Mets are leading seven nothing. And of course, that seven is so prominent because that's the Cubs lead. And here is Keith Hernandez. Keith has flied to center, flied to right. Mookie Wilson always a threat to go, and the Durham is off the bag. Pitch fouled away. Mookie was just about ready to take off. When Jody Davis got a sign from the bench, when you saw him cross his arms before that pitch, he wanted to play behind him, and Leon Durham hollered to Bruce Starr that I'm playing behind him. Now, if Mookie wants to take off, he can, but they have set up the play the Cubs have. There he goes. Fouled away. 0 oh, 2. Mookie with his 42 stolen bases. They come back and crank it up again. Meanwhile, Wally Backman standing at first, at uh, third, watching Wilson at first. Davey Johnson has a no go sign, a get a good leading goal, and he has a must go sign. 
for the base runners. And Durham is behind Wilson. They're not being cute. Wilson not going. One and two. Sometimes when a runner breaks, that first baseman will come back and hold him on. But the, the Cubs are saying, you want to go? Go ahead. We want to protect that hole between first and second. Seven nothing Mets, fourth inning. Wally Backman away from third. Mookie Wilson off the bag at first. One out. One and two the count to Keith Hernandez. Mookie goes. Ground ball to Durham. And he goes to the plate. And they've got Backman hung up. Davis throwing to Say. Say throwing to Brewstar. Brewstar back to Boa. Boa will tag him out. And the runners take extra bases and wind up at second and third. It worked out perfectly for the Mets because they gave up and out and picked up two bases. But when the ball was hit, the strategy worked for Jim Fry because Durham looked like he was going to go to first, seize the runner, and now Jody Davis has got to run him back. He's got to run him back. But now he's in the jackpot, and they're going to play run back and forth, and Backman does a good job. That play, the ball should only be handled once, and you work on it in spring training, but forget it. The best at that, though, was Hall of Famer Jackie Robinson. Oh, yeah. By the time it was over, you had two, three vendors in the rundown. <laughs> in case you are keeping score, that went three, two, five, one, six. And they will walk Daryl Strawberry. And I bet seven people play that number in the lottery tomorrow. <laughs> now, this is the second time they have walked Strawberry intentionally. Now, remember the last time George Foster followed with a big three-run home run. And in a moment, Foster will be coming up with the bases loaded. Only he'll be facing Bruce Starr and not Ruthman. Oh, here comes Foster. And he gets a standing ovation. gave no indication that they would be going inside to Foster which is what he did when Ruthven was pitching no one throwing in the Chicago bullpen the pitcher spot is due a fifth when the Cubs hit in the fifth inning Consolation for Jim Fry, of course. He turns Rick Sutcliffe loose tomorrow. Mm. Talk about turning loose. If this is Foster's pitch, watch him turn that bat loose because he's got the cripple to shoot at here at 2-0. Oh. And he hits it foul. He was out in front and checking the handle. Two and one to count. There's tomorrow's pitcher for Chicago, the big kid out of Independence, Missouri, Rick Sutcliffe. Look at that. But you know what he says? Don't make too much fuss about it. The Cubs were in first place before I got there, and they'd be in first place without me. Oh, really? Probably, but not by seven games. He's something. Great guy. Two and one to count to George Foster. He is one of eight Cubs who will or could go into the free agent market at the end of the year. Warren Brewstar eyeballing the strike zone nodding to Jody Davis and George Foster waiting up there with a the count two and one and George is not in the box. The 
that's the spot to make you swallow your cud. And now Foster backs out, and Frank Cooley is saying to him, let's get in here. Well, it's like a human rain delay is what it is. Foster, he smooths out the rubber, and then he, he puts the back foot in, and then when he gets real set, and he motions to the pitcher like he's doing right now, and that's a bit upsetting, and Bruce Dart backed off. I know certain pitchers who would say you well settled. Dig a good one, because I'm going to bury you. Two balls, one strike. Foul back, out of play. I haven't seen that much of him, but I have always heard that the human time delay in the American League is Mike Hark. Oh, yes. Oh, don't ever book an early plane with the glove, the bat. It's like the seven-year yitch, the seven-year itch, <laughs> seven-year yitch, yeah. <laughs> two and two. Fly ball the left field. It's playable. And coming up for it is Gary Matthews to put it away. However, the Mets add a run in the fourth inning. And at the end of four, the Mets seven and the Cubs nothing. We'll be right back after these messages from your local station. With the Mets leading seven to nothing, a couple of areas to look at. The five-run third, of course, broke the game wide open. Also in the hit column, the Cubs are still looking for a hit. And in four innings, Dwight Gooden has struck out seven. Not only that, he would almost be working on a perfect game, except he went three and two to the leadoff man Bob Dernier and walked him. He has then retired 12 in a row. So Dwight Gooden will now work against Keith Moreland, Ron Say, and Jody Davis in the fifth inning. Met seven, Cubs nothing. He's right after him. Moreland struck out in the second inning. Two strikes to count. Dwight Gooden working on Keith Moreland. Top of the fifth. Seven nothing Mets. Big breaking ball. One and two. Boy, it's an education just to watch it. Oh. at the right moment. Dwight Gooden had a no-hitter for four. He had struck out seven. Made a great pitch. Moreland didn't have much of a rip on it. But on a slow roller to third, Knight unable to make a play. And that is the first hit of the evening. And there was nothing Knight could do. Here you see it coming right at him. You might say, well, why didn't he let it roll? He's in fair territory, and he just couldn't do anything with it. He didn't really come up with it, I don't think, that clean either. So a squip single to Keith Moreland, and now here's Ron Say. He struck out in the second inning. One and all the count. Here's the base hit. Now watch him as he comes up with it. There's the ball. It's past third base. And he just didn't get a real good grip on it. One and all. That's in there. And Hernandez at first base is something to watch. Pick a ball player some next time you go to the ballpark. I like to watch Hernandez because he gets that glove low, watches the pitching, and he'll break to watch him now as he gets that glove down and break towards second base to protect that gap. back to that game on July the 28th we were talking before about the explosiveness of the Chicago Cubs and even though they've been pretty well hemmed in thus far the big inning for them was the eighth inning that day when they scored eight runs on five hits and broke a three three tie wide open There's a drive to right but strawberry is there. Moreland holds. 
holding at first, and Jody Davis will be coming up, coming followed right. by Larry Boa. Jody Davis. The Cubs are so consistent. They do not have a losing record against any team this year. They haven't even had a losing month. They have the best home record in baseball. They've won nine out of 12 from the Mets, winning all six at Wrigley Field and splitting six here. Well, you talk about a solid ball club. High pop foul. Hernandez coming over. Reaches in, can't make the play. Boy, he knew exactly where he was, too, because he looked at that fence twice and just drifted over there and set himself and just didn't miss it. Watch him now. Look at the wall. He looked at it once. There he is looking, checking it, looking again. Now he knows exactly where he is and just can't quite reach it. He's a good player. Oh, a boy. Good player. Six gold gloves. What a hitter. 0 and 1 to count to Jody Davis. Fly to right field in the second inning. Fastball a little high. 1 and 1. Jody, of course, had that brilliantly last year when he hit more home runs than any other National League catcher. 24. Davis this year has 18 home runs, 85 RBIs. could break in the catcher's mitt in two innings this guy a brand new and right out of the box I was just looking he right now has gone his longest without a strikeout he has faced four batters without a strikeout that's the kind of a night he's having and he has two strikes on Jody in the dirt with the curveball two and two Magnificent evening in New York. The temperature at game time was 67. A light breeze out of the south. They're talking about temperatures going to the mid and low 50s. A definite touch of fall in the air. Two balls, two strikes. Strikeouts for Dwight Gooden in four and two third innings with the Mets seven and the Cubs nothing. The so Gooden now will work on Larry Boa. Boa would appear to be a tough guy to strike out because he is just a jabber. He's not going to try and hit the ball out of the ballpark. See how Boa has done this year. Very tough to strike out. Only 22 strikeouts. So about four or five percent of the time is all five swinging and three looking. Does that tell you anything? Because he's a pesky little hitter. He doesn't swing hard. Lays the bat on the ball. One of those nits and nats that bites you eight ten times. Doesn't really hurt until you take a step. Oh and one. Bad miss. One ball and one strike to Boa. Of his strikeouts. And he rarely strikes out, but he does strike out more as a left-handed batter. There's Dan Roan on deck. He would hit for Warren Brewster. Two down. Moreland at first. Seven nothing Mets. Fifth inning. Breaking ball fouled away. You know, if he didn't hit that, I think it would have hit him on the ankle. <laughs> I swear. What a breaking ball. Duck in a score. Top of the fourth inning. Seattle two. Kansas City one. Meanwhile, bottom of the fifth. Texas one. Minnesota one. And top of the eighth. Toronto leading Detroit four to three. One and two. Two and two. Toronto has added to their lead over Detroit. They have added three in the top of the eighth inning and now in the bottom of the eighth. So it is seven to three Toronto in the eighth inning. Keith Moreland at first. Two out, fifth inning, seven nothing men. Line drive right at Backman. 
No run. One hit. One left. At the end of four and a half innings, the Mets seven and the Cubs an infield single. Well, here at Shea Stadium in New York, the crowd delighted for the good fortune of the New York Mets. But we should keep in mind that a wonderful Chicago Cub team, they have 22 games left this year, Joe. If they win 13, they will wind up with 98 victories. And last time a Cub team won 98, 1945. A long time ago. <laughs> it's a solid ball club, and so far it's been a blowout. I'll tell you, you don't lose any sleep when you get a blowout. Here's Yubi Brooks. Ball one, one and oh. Brooks, Knight, and Fitzgerald in the bottom of the fifth inning. Seven nothing New York. We were talking before when Gooden was striking out people about how he passed Grover Cleveland Alexander and his rookie record. Alexander figures prominently in this day in baseball history along with one of the most famous names in all of baseball. You have to go back in the history books on this day in 1911. Alexander was the winning pitcher over the Braves. And look who he beat. Cy Young. Uh, yeah. Two and two the county, Yubi. You know, I had the privilege of meeting Pete Alexander. 46. He was making banquets. I was at a banquet. He's the one who struck out Missouri, of course. And at this one banquet, I really admired him. He said, hey, tonight, let's do something different. Let's not strike out Missouri. <laughs> Ground ball to the right side. Sandberg will throw him out. Well, if I remember, before he struck Lazari out, Lazari right. almost hit a home run, right? Right, right. Oh, he would always make a point about that. And on our pregame show, among other things, they had President Reagan talking about the Cubs and how he broadcast their games in 1935. And didn't the president play the part of Grover Cleveland Alexander in a movie? A movie? Right. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Ground ball wide a third. Say is up with it. Just flips it across. Say is a remarkable third baseman. We've had the pleasure of watching him play a long, long time. He doesn't have a great arm, but he'll wear out your belt buckle if you don't put your glove there. He just flips it, and it's so accurate. The thing that he does, he reminds me, in that category, like Dick Grote. He doesn't give the other team the extra out. He makes the routine play. You, you're supposed to get the ground ball. He gets it. Here's Mike Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald had the base hit that began the five-run third. By the way, we're getting a correction over the wire. You know that Detroit-Toronto game? We told you that Toronto was leading 8-3. to three, but Wipe that out. Because now the correction comes over. It is Detroit 6, Toronto 4, top of the eight. How I remember one night doing a ball game and getting a report. Kenny Raffensperger, a no-hitter. Mm. Oh boy, I did 10 minutes on the life of Kenny Raffensperger and then a correction. A 10 hitter. <laughs> Only missed by 10. Oh, and two, the count to Mike Fitzgerald. Two out in the fifth inning, the Mets, seven runs, six hit. The big blow, a three run home run by George Foster. The Cubs, no runs, one hit. One and two. Kenny Raffensperger, you know, he used to give musial fits. Stan could, he'd have a tough time against Raffensperger, and, and uh, he's about the only guy I could think of. One and two to count to Mike Fitzgerald, chased it. So Bruce Starr, perhaps making his last appearance, he's due to bat first when the Cubs come up in the sixth inning. At the end of five, met seven, and the Cubs, nothing. Jim Scully with Joe Garagiola from Shea Stadium in New York wishing you a very pleasant good evening wherever you might be. It is seven to nothing Mets and the Cubs in the sixth inning. They'll have the number nine slot starting it off. You know, when you were talking about the Cubs and uh, the games coming up and in a game like tonight, in the old days when it was 154 games scheduled, managers would rationalize it by saying, hey, there's 50 games you're going to win regardless of what you do. 
50 games you're going to lose regardless of what you do. It's those other 50s that really count. And this would be one of those games, the way it's going now, if Gooden continues with the good stuff, it would be 50, one of the 50 you're going to lose, nothing you can do about it. And it is one of the last six meetings between the two clubs. Three here and three in Wrigley Field. Dan Rohn batting for Bruce Starr and Rick Russell in the bullpen. And that's popped in the air behind the plate. Fitzgerald coming to the screen. Tries to one hand it. What a play. Oh, what a catch. I tell you, that ball it was a tough play, and he's proud of it, and he should be. Now, watch how he finds the ball first. This is a great lesson for young catchers. Now, he sees it go up. Now, he'll get that mask, throw it in the opposite direction. Now, he finds the wall. Twice he finds it. Now, it's starting to drift away from him, and he slides into it. Good play. Wonderful play, and it is shown on the diamond vision out there in left field, so the whole crowd had a chance to see an excellent play by Mike Fitzgerald. So Dan Rohn fouls out, and the batter is Bob Dernier, and he strokes it to center. Wilson going back on the ball. Quickly, two out here in the sixth inning. Seven nothing Mets. And the battle will be Ryan Sandberg, who has struck out twice in the first inning and in the fourth, each time looking. Gooden with eight strikeouts. Gooden's high. He struck out 14 Dodgers back in May. Started him with a breaking ball, ball one. The brilliant Rick Sutcliffe will go for the Cubs 13 and 1 against Walt Terrell, who is 10 and 10. There's Sutcliffe. Boy, what a what a lift he gave the Chicago Cubs. What a trade that was by Dallas Green. You see Mel Hall, who was one of the men in the trades. He has three batting gloves. Can you believe that? No. One and two, and he waves them. No, he puts them in his back pocket with the fingers hanging out. So when he hits a home run, they flap and they wave goodbye. Oh, it's like a low, low five. Yeah, it's a, about a low three and a half. And the umpire the other day made him tuck them in his pocket so he wouldn't get hit with the pitch ball. One and two. And there's a one hopper down to the right side to Wally Backman. Easy inning. But Dwight Gooden, they're gone one, two, three. It does mark the first inning tonight without a strikeout. And it is 7 0 New York in the middle of the sixth. Tomorrow's game of the week. And we'll take a look at the city of Chicago. We'll go from watching the Cubs and the Mets, and Joe and I'll hop aboard a plane when this one's over and go to Comiskey Park and see about the Angels and the White Sox. The Angels chewing up the White Sox tonight. What a truck is right on the ball. You mentioned playing zoom. They take it right there. A little room service shot. <laughs> All right, guys. Others will see the Detroit Tigers and Toronto. That's tomorrow on the game of the week. Rick Russell and Dan Rohn are in the game if you're keeping score. Russell will go in Ryan Sandberg's spot. And Roan, who batted for Brewstar, will stay in at second and bat ninth. Russell was on the disabled list until after the September 1st deadline. And he is back to pitching with a 5-5 five and five record. 1-1. One and one. Check at third, no swing. Doug Harvey at first. They're going to have to make a category on a disabled list like roster maneuvering category. Little fly ball to right field. Moreland goes back and puts it away. So Gooden, a fly ball to right. One down in the sixth inning. Gooden so far has sacrificed single, scored a run, struck out eight, and allowed one hit. He has not sung the national anthem yet. <laughs> they got the K's all over here. Wally Backman hit the very first pitch for a triple, scored on the fly ball by Wilson, and then walked twice, and he has come around. 
So he's been aboard three times in the leadoff role. It is seven nothing Mets. We're in the bottom of the sixth inning. Just thinking this is a kind of a tough night for the city of Chicago. With the White Sox being wrung out in Comiskey. And the Cubs losing here seven nothing. One and one. Ball two. The Cubs had a bad Friday night here on July 27th and then turned around and beat the Mets seven straight. The Angels are leading the White Sox 11 to 2. That's fouled away. So it's the world 18, Chicago 2. Big thing with the Cubs, though, they'll be looking in that paper tomorrow. I'm sure they'll be six down, but they got their ace gone, and, and it's another day off the schedule. Ground ball foul down to Bill Robinson. It's still two and two. Don Zimmer, he knows what it's all about. He's had just about everything imaginable happen to him, including a couple of serious beatings. An original Mad who had the nickname when he first came up to the Brooklyn Dodgers, they called him Popeye because of his great forearms. All three. He's one of those guys that's, that's on my list of if I'm ever having to be in a hospital and the guy in the next bed, Zimmer be one guy who went there. Yeah, I know what you mean. to the count. Ball four. So with one out in the sixth inning, Wally Backman gets aboard for the fourth time tonight. And Russell puts him on. And the batter is Mookie Wilson. And once again, Jody Davis has indicated to Durham that uh, crossing his arms, uh, which is the signal to play behind him. Chopper to the right side, getting the hop is Roan, throws to first for the out, advancing on the play is Wally Backman to second, and the hitter will be Keith Hernandez. Later in the ball game, we'll be picking a Miller most valuable player. Of course, Dwight Gooden stands out prominently thus far. Hernandez fly to center, fly to right. And was aboard on the fielder's choice. Remember that rundown that took about 20 minutes? Ball one. The Mets scored one in the first, five in the third. The key blow, a three run home run by George Foster. And they added yet another in the fourth. The Cubs have been unable to get started against Dwight Gooden. Who opened up the game by walking Denier, who promptly stole second. And Gooden went on to strike out eight in five innings. Gooden did not have a strikeout in the sixth inning. In there. Two and one with that little slider. Second base, two out in the sixth inning, seven nothing Mets. When the Cubs hit in the seventh, they have Gary Matthews, Leon Durham, and Keith Moreland. Fastball, and he hits it into center. So here comes Backman to score, and it is eight nothing New York. And for Hernandez, he has now hit safely in 12 straight. A lot of reasons for Johnson and Knight to smile. Before the game, Davey was saying, I'd like to give my bullpen a little rest. They need it. Well, looks like he's going to be able to give his bullpen some rest. And Jim Fry would certainly like to rest Lee Smith, who has been a workhorse of late. Strike to Strawberry. So 
Keith Hernandez has just knocked in the eighth Mets run. We understand some picture problems out of Chicago. So for you folks watching the Angel White Sox game, pull up a chair and see what happens here with Daryl Strawberry, who applied to center and was walked twice intentionally. And he drives one to left center. Matthews going back. Denier going back. This one.
put it away. However, the Mets pick up three more. And at the end of six, the Mets ten, the Cubs nothing. We'll be right back after these messages from your local state. The Cubs have three innings left to avoid a whitewash tonight. How strong has Gooden been? Well, in six innings, he's made 77 pitches, 49 strikes, 18 balls, eight strikeouts, one walk, an infield hit. He has faced 20 batters, 12 first pitch strikes. And he's leading 10 to nothing. 10 to nothing. Mm. And Gary Matthews up there to challenge him. Ball one. Matthews has an amazing stat alongside his name. He has an incredible ability to get on base one way or another. His percentage this year of getting on base and related to how many games he has played, 88%. However, he is over two tonight. The drama remains as far as Gooden and his strikeouts, but the major portion of the drama went out the window in the fifth inning. He made a great pitch to the leadoff hitter Keith Moreland, and we have a moment. And this is the only hit in the game. Moreland just kind of stabbed at it. Knight couldn't make a play, and that's it. The only blot on his escutcheon. Whatever that means. Ball two. Do you think there'll be a few letters to the editor saying the score should have given him an error? I wonder how Ray Knight feels about could I have made that play if given another chance. With that 88% of getting on base, he gets on. And for Dwight Gooden, that's his second walk. He walked the leadoff man, Bob Dunier. As we mentioned earlier, it is a cool fall evening. The lights have a special crystal about them tonight. Lack of humidity. Gooden's problem will be to stay loose after long innings. Fouled away. Leon Durham rounded a short, rounded a first. Boy, here's one reason why the Cubs are so successful at home. You know, the Cubs have won 45 games of 68 at Wrigley Field. Durham has 21 home runs as we see a wave building. And only four of Durham's home runs have been at Wrigley. Uh, excuse me, only four have been on the road as I'm looking at the wave. with a 10 run lead Matthews is on at first base what Gooden is doing he's really not pitching he's throwing he doesn't have to worry about spots he just has to worry about throwing strikes because that 10 run cushion is just very nice to lean on and, and not worry about low and outside low and inside just don't walk anybody but here in the seventh inning he walked Matthews the leader but he just fired strikes to get uh, Durham there's Keith Moreland who has the only hit for the Cubs Moreland struck out and single. You know what I wonder if we can do it. Curveball for strike. If you're the center fielder and there is a wave behind home plate, is it 
tough to pick up the ball for that split second. Now they are, well, they have a little way of going. But I just wonder if you're out there in center, boy, that could be a problem. Breaking ball hit into left center. Wilson on the dead run. Foster coming, and it is backhanded by Foster. On deck, Thad Bosley. Take a look as Foster and Wilson really crisscross. Yeah, it looked like there might be a collision, and all of a sudden, boom, Attention here comes man. George. Here he comes. Having the third baseman, Ron And Sands. here comes Thad Bosley. To bat for Ron Say. Say, with the sore wrists and also the sore ankle, so they have a chance to sit him down. Also, Say, needless to say, has had a lot of trouble with Dwight Gooden. He not only was 0 for 9 against Gooden, but he struck out seven of the nine times. So he might as well sit him down. And you get Bosley in that bat to try and keep him sharp. One and all. Two balls and no strike. We're in the seventh inning. The Mets 10, the Cubs nothing. to keep your concentration in a game like this uh, and especially with all the distractions in the stands they've got waves and banners and K's and what have you and he's having a little problem concentrating three and all in there ten runs nine hits for the Mets no runs just an infield single for the Cubs and we're in the seventh Gooden with eight strikeouts. Three and two. We told you before Gooden had gone four batters without a strikeout and then he got Davis. Now he has gone seven batters without a strikeout. And he's three and two. Runner goes. Strike three call. Nine strikeouts for Dwight Gooden. No runs, no hits, a man left. And at the end of six and a half, ten nothing Mets. In the bottom of the seventh inning, with the Mets leading the Cubs, Jim Fry makes several changes. And we'll pick them all for you. Let's start with the catcher since he's right smack dab in the middle of the screen. Ron Hasse, H A S S E Y, takes over for Jody Davis. Now let's move 90 feet up the line to third base. Tom Verizer is at third. The strike. If we keep going out into left field, Gary Matthews comes out and Henry Cotto is in left. And then crisscross all the way around to right field. And Thad Bosley. Is in right. There's that. So wholesale changes. Ten nothing, New York. Bottom of the seventh. Mike Fitzgerald, who made an excellent catch of a foul ball earlier off the bat of Dan Rome, and with the bat single leading off the third inning, and that was a five-run third, and it broke the game wide open. It is 10 to nothing Mets over Chicago. Look at this. So that means the world 24, Chicago 2. Safety. One and two. Foul ball. The Mets are hoping 
to have happen to them what occurred in July when they got so hot and won 21 out of 25. They need a very, very hot streak if they're going to catch the Cubs or even make any noise. And as we mentioned at the start of the broadcast, the Mets just about feel they have to sweep here and in Wrigley Field. And the Cubs have been absolutely overpowering in their last 22 series. They've won 16 of them. The Mets with a run in the first, five in the third, one in the fourth, three in the sixth, and the Cubs with an infield single to show for it, and that's all through seven. That's a little fly ball to right. Bosley is there. One away. Rusty Staub does not figure to pinch hit tonight. Unless for one reason or another they want to just keep him sharp. And here's the man of the moment and a standing ovation. Dwight Gooden has pitched a one hitter and struck out nine in seven innings. And he has sacrificed, singled, and scored a run. A chopper behind second, backhanded by Roan, who slips, throws too late. He hustled down that line. He got himself a base hit. Rowan's right foot skidded, and that took something off the throw to first. And Gooden beat. Watch his right foot. Right there. So he kind of threw a soft poached egg over there, and Gooden beats it. Pretty good tip up on the youngster Gooden. How many pitchers with a 10 run lead would just be kind of jogging down there saying, hey, I'm going to save myself? There's no sense saving yourself. It's still going to take the normal amount of uh, rest between starts. So if you are saving yourself, it's for the junior prom. <laughs> well, Gooden is at first, and he puts on the light windbreaker. So while it back on the way. Nice quiet night in Shea. Get the feeling you're doing a game inside a bell. <laughs> I love it. I have always absolute delight of the roar of the crowd. That's why I like Wrigley Field so much. Acoustically, it's a great park, and so is Detroit. Yeah, but at least at Wrigley Field, you can cheer when you want. Here they cue you with the scoreboard. You know, you can't listen to them. Ball lead. He's tripled and walked three times. Been on base every time. Two and zero. Oh. Big crowd at Shea tonight. And the Mets breezing 10 nothing. For the Cubs, you just write this one off. It is a thoroughly forgettable game for Chicago. All right, good one. For the Mets, it's a no-brainer, a laugher. For the Cubs, it's a loss. We have the paid attendance, 46,000. 301 and there are over 48,000 in the ballpark. No, it's not close to any kind of a full house. Strike on the corner to back up. Two and two. As we said, the largest crowd ever was for a World Series game with Baltimore over 57. However, the attendance here, over a million and a half, the highest increase in attendance in the National League from last year. Minnesota has the largest increase in the majors in attendance. Pretty sure the two largest attendance increases in the National League, the Mets and the Cubs. The so Gooden at first, one out in the seventh. Ten nothing Mets. And they finally dispose of Wally Backman. is the way it began today. Look at the Cubs. 30 games above 500 and seven in front of the Mets. Philadelphia fading at 12 with the Cardinals. Philadelphia already losing. Ground foul by Mookie Wilson. Montreal beat Philadelphia seven to one. City 
according to the scoreboard, is now leading Seattle four to three. Line to left field coming up is Cotto and backhanded. No runs, one hit. A man left. And he's some man, 19-year-old Dwight Gooden. And at the end of seven, 10 nothing, New York. Join us Sunday for another NFL doubleheader on NBC Sports. Start the day at 12.30 Eastern with NFL 84 and host Bob Costas. And then the action begins. New England, Miami, Denver, Chicago, Buffalo at St. Louis, Kansas City at Cincinnati, San Diego at Seattle, Cleveland at Los Angeles for the Rams, Indianapolis at Houston. Ron Hassey, who took over for Jody Davis, it's a chance to play. He'll be followed by Larry Boa. Assey is from Tucson. He originally came up with Cleveland in 1978. His dad played in the Yankee organization. So he's a chip off the old block. He was an original draft by Cleveland in 76 and he was their number one catcher in 1983. So that's Ron Hassey. All right two strikes and that wakes up the crowd as if they've been dozing. <laughs> <laughs> he has nine strikeouts. This is important. I'll tell you why but only after the fact one and two two and two that's Danny Heap in left field finishing up for George Foster two balls and two strikes to Ron Hassey a drive to center and Wilson is there. The reason we're going to hold off anytime you get two strikes on the hitter, but we might as well let you know now. Dwight Gooden has struck out 10 or more in a game 12 times this year. The Mets record is Tom Seaver. He did it 13 times. Of course, the National League record, Sandy Koufax did it 21 times. The American League record, Nolan Ryan, 23. But the point is, he is one strikeout away from tying Tom Seaver, and he's 19. By the time he's finished, he's going to have more records than Willie Nelson. <laughs> oh, and one. Little foul off third. Knight over to take a look. You know what I'd like to see, too, is that young Red Sox pitcher, oh, Clemens. Oh, Roger Clemens. Ooh. Well, he struck out 15 and didn't even walk about it. Isn't that great young pitchers with that kind of control. Well, he's got two strikes on Boa who just doesn't strike out. He's got that good curveball that he gets when he's tired. We might see Boa go down because it's wicked. One and two to Larry Boa. Little foul ball off third, down the line, out of play. That's why he's so tough to strike out. Did you see how he just flicked that ball? He didn't really take a hard swing. Laid the bat there. Let the ball hit the bat. I wouldn't be surprised. Pride's at stake too right now. Boy just didn't want to be punched out by this kid. There's the breaking ball. He has not had good control of that. He's only thrown a couple good ones for strikes. Looked like he had it for a while, but it's been his fastball. But it's awesome. A little piece of paper, a paper airplane distracting. Boy, you sure don't want to be distracted with that kid throwing BBs out there. Mm -mm. the way he looks in he's so confident he's just looking into this catcher as we look at Boa three and two to Larry Boa and he walked him he could be tiring 
down in the bullpen just in case Wes Gardner and Doug Sisk. Second baseman Dan Roan. So Dan Roan who came into the game to bat for Warren Brewster and stayed in at second base. That gives Ryan Sandberg a rest. Matthews, Moreland, Sandberg, Say, and Davis have all come out of the game. It's 10 nothing Mets. Eighth inning. Right. Dan hit that high twisting foul ball in the sixth inning. Almost that high. And Mike Fitzgerald made a great catch. back so he's got him on too. I would think if Gooden is getting tired and Johnson makes a change it'll be because of the number of pitches that he's made because I'm sure that there is cognizant of the possibility of 10 strikeouts as we are. I think you you were mentioning earlier 77 pitches in six innings only 13 pitches an inning now he's up to 108. aware of it but he has just joined the name of Tom Seaver in the Mets record book on this pitch high fastball and she bends in the middle look at that blur almost leaving off little puffs of smoke as it goes like vapor trails so 13 times he has struck out 10 or more and there are the keys to prove it there goes number 10 a drive to center Mookie Wilson fading So no runs, no hits, a man left. And at the end of seven and a half, the Mets 10 and the Cubs nothing. Summer slipping away, fall is almost upon us, but the boys of summer still have some unfinished business. The World Series starting right here on NBC October the 9th. But of course, we got a lot of work to do before that. Starting Whoa. tomorrow at Comiskey Park, Chicago. Boy, did Hesse get one there? He got one of those buffering jobs. I mean, it. Whoa. Watch it come right off his mask. This is when you want to make sure you don't duck your head and get it right in the coconut. Tum. Whoa. Mm. Whoa. I, that brings back a lot of pain, doesn't it? It really does. I mean, it, it just is it, like getting hit with a ball peen hammer. One and one to count. A change for the Cubs. We'll give it to you in a moment. Strike. At second base, Gary Woods and Dan Rowan moves over to short. So that means only Dernier and Durham are going the distance for the Cubs. A drive to center, and there's Dernier. So Hernandez goes out. He winds up with one hit. He's still a little hot over that call strike. Here's Darrell Strawberry. Fly to center. Was walked intentionally twice. And then hit a two-run home run against Rick Russell and to left center field. Ball one. 21 home runs, 78 RBI. last year had 26 home runs but 74 RBI so he's ahead of that pace and that ball is going to be fair in the corner and Darrell has a double as Cotto gets it back in Number 25. there you see it just inside the foul line easy double for strawberry Ten runs, 11 hits for the Mets. And of course, you sit here and you think back, the only base hit for the Cubs. Slow roller to third. That was backhanded by Ray Knight. And he was unable to get any kind of a throw off. And that has to be just as frustrating. I mean, it's bad enough to get an infield single, but you can't even get a shot at the runner. And that's the difference. 
That's kind of hanging over this whole game now. It's really the official scorer's nightmare, too. Maury Allen of the New York Post is the official scorer, but I agree with him. There's yeah. nothing he can do. It was a base hit all the way, but I'm sure he'll get some heat if it is the only hit of the game. Trying. If you're wondering about the Cubs in the ninth inning, Rick Russell's spot is due to lead off. Then Henry Cotto and Leon Durham. Danny Heap battling a breaking ball. Down he goes in a heap. Jose Okendo is coming up. Finishing up. Remember, UB Brooks won out. And two out on the eighth inning, ten nothing Mets. We have given you so much misinformation off the scoreboard on Detroit that uh, <laughs> we're really kind of afraid to tell you. But according to the scoreboard, Detroit is leading Toronto 7-4 in the tenth inning. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know what else to say? A reminder to stay tuned following local news for the Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson, followed by Friday night videos, except on the West Coast and most mountain time zone stations, where it'll be seen at its regular time. I think Bo Derrick's on tonight. Just thought I'd throw that okay, in, that's thanks. all. <laughs> well, you know. Doing everything I can to keep him. <laughs> Ground foul, it's still one and two. The top of the fourth inning, Houston leading San Diego 3 0. Minnesota leading Texas 7 3 in the eighth. Kansas City leading Seattle 4 3 in the seventh. Fouled away. Angels had piled up a big lead on the White Sox, so that game was done. And here the Mets leading the Cubs 10-0. There have really been some blowouts. 10-0 here. Then the Angel game with the White Sox. Cleveland beat Oakland 13-2. In the National League, Montreal beat Philadelphia 7-1. So there are a few games tonight that were over before they were over. T-shirt or no. Fat lady singing or no. There's that great old gambling line about the race is not always to the swift and the battle is not always won by the strong, but that's the way to bet. That's the way to bet. <laughs> Three and two. Check swing, a little looper to right field. It is gonna fall. Bosley picks it up. Strawberry's coming to the plate, and they get him. From Bosley to Hassey. And a pretty good block by Bosley, uh, by uh, Hassey on a good throw by Bosley. And Strawberry, take another look. Watch Hassey's left foot. That's the key to this play, right there. He slides right into him and makes the tag. Good throw by Thad Bosley from right field. And at the end of eight, the Mets 10 and the Cubs nothing. Well, this is the big moment of the night, really. That's Keith Moreland hitting, leading off the fifth inning. Now watch. See that? Take another look. Backhand, whoop, couldn't throw it. He had trouble, and that's it. The only hit in the game. Well, the Met fans are going to say, well, he couldn't get the ball out of his glove. Why, they ought to call it a call it an error. Here's Davey Lopes batting now for Rick Russell. Ball one. Tonight's NBC light beer from Miller player of the game is without a doubt Mr. Dwight Gooden. Light beer from Miller, happy to present a check for $1,000 in the name of Dwight Gooden to the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. 19. 
won't be 20 till the middle of November. He has struck out 10 or more 13 times this year to get his name in the Mets book along with Tom Seaver. One and one to Davey. Lopes broke in on a nice note with a new club. His first hit was a 400-foot double. Nice way to say hi, guys. Yeah. Two and one to Davey. Three and one, and time by second base umpire Jerry Crawford. Evidently a disturbance down in the left field corner creating a problem. And one or two fans might even have gotten on the field. So now they said, okay, we'll close the gate and we'll continue. What's happening is that some of the fans are taking uh, Met pennants and burning them. Oh. And that's not setting too well with the Met fans. <laughs> So here's a 19-year-old Dwight Gooden pitching against Davey Lopes, who played in four World Series. Ball four. Davey's still having trouble with his eye. It's, it's not serious, but he really doesn't focus that well yet. The executive producer of NBC Sports is Michael Weisman. The coordinating producer for NBC Baseball is Harry Coyle. The telecast of today's Game of the Week has been produced by George Finkel. Directed by Harry Coyle. Free game produced by Les Dennis. Technical director, Lenny Stucker. Our thanks to Steve Dance for his work here in the booth. Our left and right hand. And we'll move the show to Chicago's Comiskey Park tomorrow. at first Cotto the batter and Leon Durham on deck Matthews while he was in there struck out flied out and won got him Frank Pulley to play the umpire the way he punches out those strikes will have a sore arm tomorrow. <laughs> He's really been punching him out tonight. And Gooden has been punching him out. 11 strikeouts for Dwight. And now here is Leon Durham who could go from here to the Hall of Fame because he has not struck out. Durham has grounded to short, grounded to first, and flied to center. He and Boa and he pops it up. It'll be Wally Backman. Two down in the ninth. So Dwight Gooden with 11 strikeouts is one out away from carrying the Cub lead to six. But of course the enthusiasm has to be tempered here in New York by the thought that Rick Sutcliffe will be going for the Cubs tomorrow against Walt Terrell. The crowd on its feet now. Tom Verizer at the plate. A check swing looper. Okindo picks it up and throws him out. And all of the Mets come out to congratulate the brilliant Dwight Gooden. 19 years old. Strikes out 11, allows only a squib single to Ray Knight. That's all. What a masterpiece. 10 0 New York. We'll be back after this. This special edition of the Major League Baseball Game of the Week has been brought to you by Skin Bracer Aftershave. Takes care of men who take care of themselves. Skin Bracer by Menon. By Armor All. It's science, but it works like magic. By Low and Brow. When you want the taste of a truly great beer, there's really only one. Tonight, let it be Low and Brow. And by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? Again, Dwight Gooden allows one hit, and here it is in the fifth inning, off the bat of Keith Moreland. 
Coming over to the bag is Ray Knight, and right there, he just had trouble, couldn't make the play, and it's the only hit allowed by Gooden. A reminder, stay tuned following local news for the Tonight Show, starring Johnny Carson, followed by Friday Night Videos, except on the West Coast and most mountain time zone stations, where it will be seen at its regular time. Gooden strikes out 11, wins his 15th. He is 3-2 and two against the Cubs. Ruthven is the loser. He is 5-10. and 10. And we'll move our show to Comiskey Park tomorrow, where the Angels go with the Chicago White Sox. But Joe Garagiola, this Vega winner tonight is Philip Polizano, 8695 25th Avenue in Brooklyn, New York. So, Philip, good smoking. We're going now to the top of the sixth. John Tudor to lead off for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Tudor singled in the third. One of the two hits given up by Dwight Gooden in this game. Gooden has struck out nine. He needs one to tie the all-time record by a rookie pitcher. Curb score, who struck out 245. And the first pitch, a fastball. Tudor with 15 hits is no lamb at the plate. Pretty good for a guy who came over from the American League just this year, too. That DH, all that talent wasted. There's a good fastball. The count one ball, one strike. Good and struck out the side in the fifth. Got two in the fourth, two in the third, two in the second. And a perfect pitch right there in the count one and two. So the record is within one strike of Dwight Gooden. Crowd standing up. They want to be a part of it. Fast ball in the count, two balls and two strikes. Gooden has struck out his last four batters. Leading by a score of two to nothing. And it's fouled back out of play. Tudor fouling off a very good pitch. Pitch right in tight, right around the letters. No teenager has ever led the league in strikeouts while striking out over 200 batters. Until this year. You predict that. There it is. He has just tied the all time record for strikeouts by a rookie pitcher with his 245th strikeout, tying Herb Score, who did that back in 1955 for the Cleveland Indians. Got him with a curveball. Ovation for Dwight Good. Dwight looking around as time has been called, something thrown on the field. And you have just witnessed a striking event. And Dwight now with a chance to make history of his own. His next strikeout, of course, gives him the record all by. Himself. Back in 1955, I was playing for the Cleveland Indians when Herb scored. Herb strike one, set that record, but it wasn't built up like it is here. Of course, that was before the exposure of television, and it certainly wasn't done in New York, where the media picks up all of that. You get buried in Cleveland. And how appropriate, Mr. Kiner, for you to be calling it when Dwight Gooden equals the record of your old teammate. And there's a breaking ball in the count, one ball and one strike. Marvell Wynn has flied out twice, so he has not struck out in this game. And a good fastball, and it goes to one and two. Dwight Gooden with his 10th strikeout here in this inning has set a new Met record for strikeouts of 10 or more in a ball game. Breaking the record held by Tom Seaver. Dwight has struck out 10 or more now in 
14 games, the last four in a row, and this could be the record. Curveball, and he swing. They didn't appeal it. So, no call by third base umpire Bruce Remy. Ball played it. Umpire Lanny Harris could have gone down in the record book right there. Two balls, two strikes. The record. Roy Gooden has set a new Major League record for strikeouts by a rookie pitcher, and he is the first pitcher, 19 years of age, to have a chance to be the strikeout leader. The ball is taken out of play. Congratulations all around as the game has been stopped. Dwight Gooden with his 11th strikeout now has 246 strikeouts. corner in commemoration of this rookie record strikeout. The boys in the K corner have hung out the most enormous red K in the history of K corners around Major League Baseball. They used to do it for Nolan Ryan in California. And Dwight Gooden has really set this town on its ear. In fact, all of baseball this season. And that huge K, emblematic of his 246th record-breaking strikeout. And a hard ground ball by the third baseman Bray Knight in the left field as Lee Lacey comes up with a double right after the momentous strikeout. So now the crowd's sitting down, and now Gooden has some more work to do. Well, Dwight shocked back into reality here by this extra base hit by Lacey, who has now hit a nine straight ball games, and the task at hand now is to get a W. A two to nothing lead is not all that great. The tying run now will come to the plate for Pittsburgh. And Dwight has to go back to work. And the very dangerous Johnny Ray, the batter. Ray with a single, one of the three hits that Pittsburgh has. Ray hitting 308 for the year. And the fastball is low for ball one. Ralph, I really think that's great that you were here to call it when Dwight Gooden broke the record of a pitcher that you played with so long ago when he first set the record. Well, they say records are made to be broke, broken, but Herb Score, one of the great gentlemen in the history of baseball, now broadcasting for Cleveland, I'm sure will be very disappointed. His career was shortened when he was hit by a line drive off the bat of Gil McDougal, and after that really never was the pitcher that he was in 1955. He was hit right in the head with that line drive, actually in the eye. And he changed his pitching motion after that to give himself a little more defense when he followed through and never really had the great fastball after that. How fleeting fame can be. Two balls, no strikes, the count to Johnny Ray. Mets leading 2 nothing. so Ray, a dangerous batter in a tough situation. He fouls off a fastball. Johnny Ray has hit an eight of his last nine 